Krishnan. Very nice to see some cases and now we are moving back to something very mundane and day to day which is periop glucose control 2013 the changing scenario. What I am going to do is very quickly tell you pre-op assessment of diabetes but what is important because we are all metabolic physicians is we must recognize that like measuring TPR and blood pressure glucose is a vital sign and glucose is the fifth vital sign and in the hospital setup glucose needs to be monitored independent of diabetes so that's one take home message which i want to tell everybody here i'm going to talk a little bit on insulin and myocardial infarction inpatient glycemic control and ideally you should make your in own inpatient protocol the commonest thing which we see when a patient comes to the hospital is usually for a surgery and what are the metabolic consequences of anesthesia and surgery so we get something called as stress hyperglycemia what is stress hyperglycemia it is the counter regulatory hormone which have gone up the cortisol the catecholamines the glucagon the growth hormone and there is excess sympathetic tone and sympathetic activity and all that leads to hyperglycemia like stress hyperglycemia we just had a very nice case of steroid related hyperglycemia that's also not a stress hyperglycemia so what happens when there is high glucose the outcome of hospital care is poor because whenever there's a metabolic stress response the stress hormones and peptides go up insulin goes up goes down glucose goes up you get a lot of free fatty acids ketones lactate somebody was concerned about lactate very correctly you get immune dysfunction infection gets disseminated we get a lot of redox and free oxidative stress transcription factors secondary mediators apoptosis injury inflammation and you get prolonged hospital stay disability and death so you can't really ignore it so when somebody gets admitted to a hospital first thing is look at the history of diabetes and obtain a blood glucose at admission. So let us look at the first scenario. No history of diabetes. The blood glucose is less than 140. Probably based on clinical parameters, you may or may not test. If the history of diabetes is not there, but blood glucose is above 140, you need to be a little concerned. And then you need to go to start monitoring glucose and do an A1C and reassess the patient after a day or two. And if the A1C is about 6.5, you need blood glucose monitoring. And if somebody has history of diabetes, you need to do blood glucose monitoring. So it's very simple and we need to use A1C in the hospital to differentiate new onset diabetes from stress hypoglycemia. If the A1C is below 6.5, it's stress hypoglycemia. If it is above 6.5, it's new onset diabetes. Assess glycemic control prior to admission. We know to need to know the A1C if somebody is a diabetic. And assist designing the right regimen. Somebody has an A1C of 12 and is walking into a hospital, we need at discharge for him to probably be on some insulin therapy and education of that patient. So remember, simple A1C more than 6.5 tells you it's diabetes. So you need to do an A1C, you need to do a lot of other tests, I wouldn't go into details of that. But whenever a patient walks into a hospital for surgery, first thing is, you must know about the operation. How long will it last? Will it be, will the patient be NBM? Will it be in morning or afternoon? What is the method of anesthesia and surgery? So we must know about the surgery. You know, if it's ambulatory surgery, cataract surgery, coming in, coming out, going out in the evening, you may be very well off doing just a simple oral therapy if the A1C is below 6.5. But somebody is going to go through a general anesthesia, he's going to be nil by mouth for 12 hours. The whole protocol is to be different. About the patient, is he well patient? Is he a walking, talking patient? Or is he unwell, sick, comorbid patient? What is the A1C? Does he suffer from any hypoglycemic episodes? And is he on diet? tablets insulin or combinations and what is the dose of insulin type of insulin and time of insulin so first thing is about operation how long will it last how long will be the patient to be nil by mouth afterwards is it morning afternoon and what's the method of anesthesia remember whenever we do perioperatively there's a lot of neuroendocrine stress response peripheral insulin resistance increase hepatic glucose production beta cells are dysfunctioning lot of protein and fat breakdown and potential hyperglycemia and even ketosis in some cases. This is typically a case where you can see during cardiac surgery, decline of insulin sensitivity in patients with or without diabetes. And this was a JCM paper published in 2010 by Sato et al. And you can see with general anesthesia, with epidural anesthesia, the glucose levels are very different. You can see here the classical pattern here, the blood glucose level really spikes up during general anesthesia compared to epidural anesthesia. So obviously the type of anesthesia matters. 
So if it's a regional anesthesia, there's a lesser stress response. Hypoglycemia is readily detectable. Post-op nausea is reduced. Early post-op diabetes control is possible. But there are some disadvantages with CV and neurological conditions. While in general anesthesia, you need to know the cardiorenal status. You have a potential of intra-op hypoglycemia. We need to recognize autonomic neuropathy. We need to avoid hypotension. And we need to protect pressure sores and pressure areas. Now remember, if somebody is fasting for surgery and volume depleted, it will contribute to metabolic decompensation. Somebody is a type 1 diabetic. He is very prone to DKA if you don't give him an insulin drip. Somebody is a type 2 diabetic, you can actually, he is brittle. He might get into hyperosmolar, hyperketotic state and infection and wound healing always remains. The next thing is, is he well, is he unwell? What is the level of glycemia? Are there hypoglycemic episodes? Just see the A1C. Look at cardiac disease. Does he have intermittent claudication? Does he have angina, per peripheral vascular disease, postural hypertension, any neurological diseases, heart rate variability, autonomic dysfunction? Does he have glycosuria, renal failure, CKD, GFR? And look at skin, feet and general examination. And last is about diabetes treatment. So obviously there is very clear consensus. Before any surgery in the hospital, in critically ill patients, keep the glucose between 140 and 180. Very, very carefully monitored patients, 110, 140 may be desired, but that's a debatable issue. And in non-critical ill patients, keep again your glucose between 140 and 180. So one take-home message for all of y'all is, keep your glucose between 140 to 180 in a hospitalized setup. <coughs> what in non-critical situations? As I said, pre-meal below 140, random blood glucose below 180 in majority of the patients. And based on the clinical status, you need to modify. For example, somebody is terminally ill, limited life expectancy, high risk of hypoglycemia, you might have a glucose range up to 200. Just last year, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, American College of Physicians said, you don't have to be very tight in some situations. These are those situations, terminal illness, limited life expectancy, lot of hypoglycemia, it's okay, but just keep it below 200. And you need to avoid hypoglycemia. Okay, so it's important even in the hospital setup, because too much of peak and valleys can be very disastrous. Try to keep your blood glucose, but not below 100, particularly modify your glucose lowering medications if they are below 70. So simply, if somebody is going to be on a surgical protocol and he is on an evening dose of basal insulin, don't change the dose prior to admission. If the surgery is in the AM, check the blood glucose on admission, no dose change. And if he is for a PM surgery, check the blood glucose on admission and half the night dose if he is for the PM, PM surgery. If he is on a morning basal insulin, again on the prior day of admission, no change in dose. On the, if he is for AM surgery, check the blood glucose and half the morning dose. And if he is for PM surgery, there is no need for any dose change. If he is on a premix regimen, again the prior day, no need to dose change it. But on, if he is for AM or morning surgery, half the morning dose, check the blood glucose level, leave the evening dose unchanged. And if he's for PM surgery, again half the usual morning dose, check blood glucose at admission, leave evening dose unchanged. If he's on twice daily separate, you know, free mix regimen, that is short and intermediate action, previous day nothing, but you need to calculate total dose both in morning insulins, give half of intermediate acting only in the morning, check blood glucose levels and leave it unchanged. And similar protocol for PM surgery. If he's on three, four or five injections, that is a basal bolus regimen, then you probably need to be a little more careful and you need to titrate it better. What about oral agents? Day prior to admission, if he's on acarbose, megalitonide, metformin, SU, gliptins, GLP-1 analogs, probably on a simple surgery, short starvation period, and if you are not going to miss more than one meal, you can probably take the tablet. But if it's an AM surgery, usually we try to omit the morning dose if the patient is NBM. Metformin, it depends on the creat clearance. And probably sometimes secretagogues we omit a day prior or on the day of surgery, gliptins particularly, or GLP-1 analogs, and similar protocols are there. I was alluding to this study, which I was talking in the previous. This is a study by Gurlo M. Perez, where he actually added citagliptin <coughs> to inpatient management of general medicine and surgery in type 2 diabetic patients. What they did is, they received citagliptin with glargine and basal bolus regimen. And they simply found that with simple citagliptin, in combination with basal uh, insulin, was as effective because the number of insulin doses came down. 
You don't have to give this basal bolus protocol. You just give a basal insulin and citagliptin and you do the same. So where do you really need to be careful? The only time you need to be careful in the hospital is when the person is type 1 diabetic and he's going through a minor or major surgical procedure. You need to give insulin drip or basal bolus to prevent hyper and hypo during period period. You need to discontinue oral and non-insulin injectable anti-diabetic agents and initiate patient on insulin therapy who will develop hyperglycemia. And we need to institute subcutaneous therapy post-surgically, particularly basal who is nil by mouth and basal bolus who are eating. So what is the standard protocol in medical or surgical non-ICU patients? Type 2 diabetic with more than 120 and he is nothing per oral, uncertain oral insulin, start basal insulin with a dose of 0.2 to 0.25 units per kg per day. That's a standard dose and you can reduce that total dose to 0 0.5 units per kg per day if the age is more than 70 or the creatinine is more than 2. So this is a standard protocol. This is the ACE ADA protocol which I am telling you. It is full text available, free, downloadable on the ACE website. You can just take this protocol down. It's very straightforward, very simple to follow. That somebody is nil by mouth, we don't know how he's going to eat. Just give a small dose of basal insulin and <coughs> you can manage it. If there is adequate oral intake, probably you need to start basal bolus. The total daily dose could be around 0.4 to 0.8. Reduce it to half basal, half bolus and adjust as needed. Now how do you do a correction bolus? Because many a times in the hospital you need a correction bolus. So correction bolus is for any blood glucose above 140. There is a correction factor. And what is the correction factor? Usually it is 1500 divided by the daily re insulin requirement. For example, for 60 kilograms, if the daily insulin requirement is around 50, then this is how you do a correction bolus dose calculation of 3 units. And you can have an insulin rate. It can differ from protocol to protocol. It needs education of resident doctors and nursing staff. It's all about education. And remember, sometimes in hospitals, patients have to be taken for emergency surgery. So what do we do when a patient comes for emergency surgery? Look at the metabolic status. Look at glucose, pH, creatinine, ketones. Look at volume status for orthostasis and urinary output and ECG. Now remember, delay surgery if possible if the metabolic control and volume sta status is not stable. If he's hemodynamically unstable, you, need to be, you are going to be in trouble. Optimize glucose, electrolytes and acid-based status with insulin and glucose infusions. A saline infusion if ins a volume is depleted depending on the renal function and cardiac status. Potassium infusion if renal function is normal and potassium is normal or low. And a bicarb infusion only in patients with severe acidosis. So you often need to do some of these things in emergency surgery. Because outcomes in emergency surgery, non-cardiac, non-vascular are poor. They have an odds ratio of perioperative mortality of 1.19. So that's the time you need to be really very careful in non-cardiac surgical cases. So as I told you, ACE has this typical inpatient glycemic control resource center. It has all these slides. It has how to make it happen. It has beautiful powerpoints, glucometrics, diet nursing data, how to transit a patient from inpatient to outpatient. And it tells us everything which has to be done. So I'm picking up some of those slides here. We know that Diabetes is a big problem in hospitals, but we also know when there is myocardial infarction. What happens with diabetes and myocardial infarction? A lot of glucose, glycolysis, ATP, free fatty acid metabolism is impaired, GLUT4 is modified, there is a lot of autonomic dysfunction, sympathetic vagal imbalance, plaque rupture and arrhythmias. And if you give insulin, it improves glucose to the heart muscle. It decreases free fatty acid output. It improves contractility. It's anabolic hormone. It reduces arrhythmias, promotes glycolysis, reduces PI-1, reduces platelet aggregation, and avoids the risk of OHA use. We all know that if there is high glucose in general surgical and medical patients, particularly if the glucose is about 220 on day one of post-operative, it's a sensitive predictor of nosocomial infection. Remember, if your glucose day one post-op is about 220, then there is a 2.7 times higher infection rate and 5.9% higher infection rate for severe infection. This is published data. Portland cardiac surgeons told us that simply by giving good IV infusion, the deep sternal wound rate after bypass surgery comes down from 2% to 0.8%. And you can see here very, very clearly, lower the blood glucose, lesser is the deep wound infection, particularly after cardiac surgery. And that's why most people still use the Portland protocol. Remember, even if you keep your glucose between 100 to 150, 13% of patients will still have a deep wound infection. 
So remember, but 67% will have deep wound infection if the glucose is between 250 and 300. So when it comes to cardiac surgery, you need to be ultra tight. Okay, that's something which is very important. And there's also mortality data, which Fudnari et al. published in cardiac surgery for the uh, post-op CABG, that you need to be very, very tight. You can see the difference in mortality with glucose goals. So glucose is a vital sign. It increases mortality. It increases morbidity, it increases length of stay in the hospital, and it increases cost of hospital. It's a quality of care issue, it's a safety issue, it's a stay issue, and it has a lot of challenges. In the good old days, people thought, little bit of glucose, acute problem, sliding scale, you know, no problem. You can ignore it. But now, we know that there's early evidence, particularly in 2004 and 2005, that in acute myocardial infarction, cardiac surgery, surgical ICU, when there's a lot of enteral parental nutrition, Vandenberg study, it shows that probably you need to have a very aggressive pattern. But a call curve action only came in 2006 and new evidence said too tight may not be good. There were conflicting reports. They looked at safety, hypoglycemia, potential for harm. Particularly the VICEP study showed, you know, you do very tight control, it doesn't make a difference on mortality. Then came the so-called Weissner study, again no major change. So the ADA and ESD and the AS revised their inpatient glycemic control and they said reasonable achievable and safe glycemic targets. So I'm leaving with, with these five or seven last questions. Let us look at the first question. Does improving glycemic control improve outcomes in patients with hypoglycemia? And here you can see that we are not so sure. But if your glucose is between 100 to 200, two-fold chances of death in MICU. If it is between 200 to 300, three-fold and above 300, four-fold, patient will die. This is the deep infection wound rate in CABG, it matters. But admission glucose in a casualty or an emergency room in non-ICU can also impact complications. Below 200, less complications with community acquired pneumonia. They just did an admission blood glucose above 200. People died faster. Does improving glycemic control improve outcomes? We don't know the data. Okay, there are studies which show its benefit. Digami, Luvin, Chrisley, Luvin 2 benefit. But there are studies like glucocontrol, YCEP, nice sugar which show no benefit. So people were left with a lot of confusion. I'm skipping some of these slides, like nice sugar slides, because a large study, it showed that if you do very tight control at 81 to 108, you might have low, more hypoglycemia and lower glucose targets. So we have to look at that population. The second question which I'm asking is, what is the glycemic target recommended for different patient populations? What should we target? Remember, infusion required for everybody, but starting threshold should never be above 180. Maintain glucose between 140 and 180, but don't go below 100. Above 180, not recommended. In non-ICU, keep pre-meal below 140, random below 180. Don't let your glucose go below 100, and particularly below 70, and severe hypoglycemia below 40. What treatment will you achieve these targets? Well. Avoid OHS, you can use gliptins, but I would still say avoid it. Insulin can be used, IV, in critically ill, subcute in non-critically ill. There are a lot of protocols, Yale, Luvin, Portland, Digami. Okay, you can have your own protocol. You can just go on the website and make your own protocol. These are different protocols, I wouldn't go into details of them. But all these protocols essentially, eventually lead to simple basal bolus regimens, all of them. And ban the sliding scale. Sliding scale slides to death. Rabbit 2 is the only evidence in type 2 diabetes, which simply showed a simple basal bolus regimen, very elegantly looking at glycemic control and ensuring that the meal time bolus, the correction of the supplemental bolus does very well. It's easy to calculate doses. Okay, I wouldn't go into doses because I've already told you about it. And you can also do a pre-mill algorithm. The algorithms are also not difficult. There are people with pumps. We have the basal bolus, but nowadays we have the rapid basal collection, super bolus corrections, the other uh, protocols. So remember, in inpatient glycemia, there are two challenges sometimes we face. Enteral and parenteral nutrition and steroid therapy. We just had a very elegant discussion on steroid therapy, so I wouldn't dwell with that, or enteral and parenteral nutrition, but you need to give additional supplements in these situations. My next question is, does inpatient management of hypoglycemia represent a safety concern? Of course it does. Because in the hypoglycemia is a concern because carbohydrate changes, food changes, nursing orders change, patient gets shifted for, uh, you know, different types of investigations, poor communication, 
okay order writing and transcription can be a challenge so hypoglycemia prevention is nurse education and resident doctor education remember also all our glucose is measured on the meter meter have a plus or minus 20 percent variation from lab levels there's a lot of discrepancy between arterial venous and capillary samples there is anemia polycythemia hypoperfusion some medicines which affect the point of care with glucose measures so remember it's not easy my last couple of questions is what do we need to do with it we need to have your own protocol we need to make it cost effective we need to reduce length of stay and we need to transit patient well remember when a patient gets discharged from the hospital it is the ideal time to motivate him for insulin therapy or better diabetes care okay give him proper diet educate him on monitoring tell him about medicines insulin give him treatment goals because one of the poorest things we do in our hospitals is the discharge if you manage discharge well you can do extremely well so you need to teach that patient survival skills and of course there are a lot of areas of future research but my conclusions are glucose is a vital sign higher the glucose poorer is the clinical outcome particularly in the hospital setting despite of inconsistencies in clinical trial results good glucose control is an important in hospitalized patients keep it between 140 to 180 110 to 140 research is going probably may be required too tight below 110 may not be required okay so remember that and be careful of hypoglycemia in non icu settings insulin therapy can be tailored sliding scale should be banned you can use clinical judgment and also remember post discharge you need to relook at the ongoing glycemic control and always use any time you need any of these resources just go to the ace website it's a fantastic website i recommend all of you all to go on it and make your own inpatient glycemic protocol because you should have like dr vijay kumar got me here i'm sure he has dr vijay kumar's protocol in his own hospital i'm sure of that correct or so must be krishna or sadashiv rao they all have their own protocol you should have your own protocol it's it's all about your own protocol educating your own residents and your own nurses for getting the right glycemic control remember it's an excellent educational opportunity it's not just about tight glycemic control or insulin use it's about an educational opportunity you get with a patient and their relatives inside the hospital setting thank you for a patient here So thank you, Dr. Shashank. That is what is Shashank. He is very precise, clear. Shashank, Shashank, Dr. Shashank. please on the stage. And uh, I request the audience, it is open for questions. Questions also should be very precise, clear, and uh, it is all goal oriented. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. In, uh, I see a lot of patients who are on prolonged rice soup feeding, usually second hourly. They are not in a continuous rice tube feeding. This is for weeks together or months together, usually neurosurgical patients. How do you usually tackle them? Well, I think this is a situation. Rice tube feeding occurs usually from morning to night, and at night they don't do normally two hourly feeds. So usually a good dose of basal insulin in the morning might be in order. You need to titrate them. It also depends on the type of rice tube feeds. Now, there are many formulas, enteral formulas given through rice, rice tube, which are so-called low on glycemic index. But lot of the formulas used by our surgical colleagues were very high on glucose. So you need to see what is the rice tube feeding or is it just so what is the content of your rice tube feeding? What is the frequency of rice tube feeding? But most of the time you need to do a four hourly glucose monitoring in rice tube. We have our own rice tube protocols based on the feeds. We normally use a glucose free agent inside the rice tube and we have our own designed diets for that. At night, we don't give anything. We normally give a small basal insulin in the morning and then correct it with a small bolus dose based on the rice tube feed which has been administered. Rice tube long term okay, can be very challenging. Often then they go on peg insertions and that's what happens with most of the rice tube feeds if they need it long term care. And again, it can be another challenge which is there. But a small dose of basal insulin normally takes care of it. Okay, but you need frequent monitoring. We recommend four hourly monitoring and you need to take care of them very critically and particularly at night you they are very vulnerable to hypoglycemia we see this very often and length of stay gets a challenge there also remember if somebody is on rice tube more than seven days okay you should relook at the indication of rice tube and you should also then look at if it's going to be chronic terminally long-term care okay look at a peg insertion if it is not chronic long-term care 
then probably you might do without the rails too okay so that's the two things which you need to look at thank you we have a stroke unit and in our stroke unit we see this problem all the time they are just put on the rails tube they stay there for 3 3 weeks and we often we have length of stay meetings in our hospital we try to reduce length of stay one of the doing ways of doing it is taking the rails tube out so remember after 7 days it is our job to take it out sometimes our neurology colleagues do not like it very much but we don't have a choice there and uh, thing in icu what is the role of basal insulin because we control with only regular or the bolus in what in icu, ICU. in icu i think i think it's 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 in iv it. iv infusion and and an iv infusion it doesn't matter whether you use regular insulin or analog it's it works the same though analog companies may not like what i'm saying but that's that's the truth and i think it it's iv is good but there is data to show that you can even use subcut protocols okay but not on day 1 mm -hmm. or day 2 surgically usually after day 2 once the patient goes on a little bit of at least liquid diet or rails tube feeding you can move to subcut insulin it's not sacrosanct that you have to be on oral you know that they have they have managed diabetic ketoacidosis with subcutaneous insulin also there is data on that but i would not be so over zealous i would rather play safe keep an iv protocol on board for the first 48 hours and then relook at the protocol after 48 hours any other questions there are no more questions uh, i think we thank and we want a very good